Yeah. All right. You want to? You want? Now, what'd you put here? Okay. I would actually, yeah. I put true because I believe that it does define the executive power, but maybe not necessarily that in detail. Okay. Okay. Gives him enumerated powers like the the commander in chief, but there's all the stuff that we kind of have to. Read in between the lines. Ah, read in between the lines. All right, so let's 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 uh, let's start here, right? So we have Article Two, Section One, right? And it says the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States. So, Cindy, does that provision, Article Two, Section One, by itself, tell us what the executive power is? Not really. Okay, I like the way you phrased it. I remember what you said. Just say it again louder, please. Okay. It's not enumerated in the sense we're used to. So we look at Article 1, Section 1. I, I put these here right next to each other so you can compare them, right? And Article 1, Section 1, which is, of course, Congress's power, says all legislative powers herein granted... Here and granted. So, Anakari, what do we say this means, here and granted? What's the significance of that language? Exactly. Primarily Article 1, Section. One. Section. Where are they mostly listed? Oh, 08. Good, very good. Thank you. Right. So, we studied this the first couple weeks of class that Congress only has the powers listed. And Anakari, just finish it up. If a power is not listed in Article 1, Section 8, does Congress have it? No. That's right. We know that from the Tenth Amendment, right? All powers that are not delegated to the government, the central government, are reserved to the states and the people. But then we get down to Article 2. And it's different, right? It doesn't say the executive powers that are here and granted. It doesn't say the executive powers as in plural. It says the, singular, executive power, right? It's not powers A, B, C, D, E, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you know, clauses 1 through 21, whatever it is, right? It's the executive power. So I think what Sam's getting out his answer is there's a, you guys hear the bundle of sticks yet in property? Yeah. I did this last week. A bundle of powers, if you may, right? There's not a single... <laughs> God, <laughs> this happens when a property professor teaches Kamala, right? There's not a single definition of the power, but there is a bundle of these powers. There are different attributes of power, right? Now, Sam's right. The Constitution does list some of these powers. Which, just walk me through. What are some of the powers of the presidency that the Constitution does list? Specifically, like war powers. Um, okay, well, w what are the war powers? Where, where does it say that? So, the power to declare war uh, would the, be. Which branch has a power to declare war? So, Congress can sustain war or declare war, but the president has the power to, like, wage war, how he, he sees. Well, the word wage isn't in the Constitution. The, you were right before. Congress has the power to declare war. That, that much is easy, right? But what I think Sam mentioned a minute ago, the president is called the commander-in-chief of the army and the navy and the militias of the several states when they're called into service. Can the president engage in military action without a declaration of war? This is one of the most pressing and ongoing and never-ending questions in the history of our republic. Does a declaration of war authorize the president to use force? Or is it merely declaring that we're no longer in a state of peace because the foreign nation were in a state of war? Okay. I don't have an answer for this one. This one goes on and on and on. Okay. But those aren't the only powers that are listed. 
the executive, right? Janelli, what are some other powers the president has that we know from the Constitution? Very good. You're reading that article. Very good. Yeah. He can seek writings. We know the president can make nominations to offices. He can negotiate treaties. He can receive ambassadors. Just go write down Article 2. So, uh, uh, Rachel, let me ask you this question then, right? We have a lot of things listed, right? Commander-in-chief, receive ambassadors, make nominations, treaties, whatever, right? Are those all of the president's executive powers. That is, when the Constitution, Constitution refers to the executive power, are those limited to the items listed in Article 2? How do we know that? The take care clause. So is the take care clause, and, and I'll bring it up, I have it on, on the board. The Constitution says the president shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. What does that mean, Rachel? You brought it up, I'll ask what it means. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Abdul. You're, very, you're much nice to me. Raquel, what does that mean? What does that mean? But does that give the president additional executive powers? Mm. Ruth, what does that remind you of, the take care clause? It's similar to the thing we studied before. I think Raquel, Raquel sorry. I think Raquel stated it well. What, what does this take care clause maybe remind you of that we've studied so far? That's correct. Yeah, finish up. Very good, Raquel. Um, that's right. We study necessary and proper in that it gives Congress additional authority to carry into execution the foregoing powers, right? It's an additional grant of power. In some respects, I think I like where Raquel phrased it, the take care clause can be seen as a delegation of additional powers to carry into execution the laws. That doesn't answer my question exactly. Right? Ruth, now you get your actual now you get the next question, right? Are the president's enumerated powers? Is that it? Does it go beyond the items listed in Article Two? Okay, Ruth says yes. Now tell me how do we know that? We, whoa, 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 whoa. You just said yes. You told me yes. The answer is yes. Now, the, now you're saying you're not sure? We do, um, but they're not written. They're just internal policy. Oh, boy. Okay, oh, boy. Inherent. Uh, name tag? Oh, what's your name? Alexandra. Alexandra, that's fine. Alexandra, what's inherent powers? What does that mean? Uh, Ruth just said inherent powers. What, what, what does this word inherent mean? Okay, good. I can in here is. But what does it mean in the context of the president to have inherent powers? Ah, so Alexandra says by virtue of being president, by virtue of taking the oath of office, the president gets certain powers. Is that that basically your answer? Okay, Martin, is she right? Where do we where do we get this from? Where does it say when the president takes the oath of office, he gets all these powers and and he has them and we don't know what they are. They're not written down anywhere, but but he's got them. Where, how do we know this? You just assume, baby. You know what happens when you assume, right? <laughs> but ha why are you making that assumption? Where do we get where do we get this from? You read you read Lincoln, right? You you read Youngstown. You read Tawny. Where, where do we get this assumption from? Okay, I like where we're going. But David. If the president doesn't have this power, isn't that power then just reserved for the states and the people? Is that what the 10th Amendment says? Why do we have to give it to the president? Why can't some other branch exercise it? Um, 
No, 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 but let's be clear, David, right? The point of executive power is he doesn't need Congress. He can act on his own two feet. Then why then should we give these presidents these un, undefined, unenumerated, inherent, right? Do the scare quotes, right? Inherent powers. Well, where do we get this from? Okay, okay. Robert, unfortunately, David brought the Federalists. What did, what did Hamilton say? <laughs> Right? What? I, I didn't ask about it. He did, right? So what? What did? I was going to bring up this quickly, but I will now. What did? What did Hamilton say about the executive and the presidency? Ah. So this idea of executive powers is not. I'm sorry. The idea of inherent executive powers. This is Ruth's comment a minute ago. It's not spelled out in the Constitution, right? I've read Article 2 over and over again. You can do it the same. Um, it's not in there, right? It doesn't really say it one way or the other. But I think what David and Robert are getting at is it's essential for an executive to do certain things, right? That is the basis of our entire class today, right? When we're talking about a power that's enumerated, it's an easy question, right? Can the president receive ambassadors? Yes, he can receive ambassadors. Can the president nominate people? Yes, he can do that. Can he serve as commander or chief? Yeah, no problem there. What about when it's not written down? Right? When it's not clearly defined? Can the president um, suspend the writ of habeas corpus? This is merriment. Can the president emancipate slaves in, in the rebel territory? That's the Emancipation Proclamation. Can the president take control of a steel mill during a, a national steel shortage in time of war? That's Youngstown, right? These aren't cases where there's a clear line in the Constitution saying the president can do this or can't. And in, in these cases, sometimes Congress supports the president. Sometimes they're quiet about it. And sometimes they might actually oppose the president. And um, you read Justice Jackson's opinion in Youngstown. Um, Jackson was, again, a concurring opinion, but it's come to represent the, um, the definitive statement of executive power. Um, and not because it's very strict and textualist. He was looking at it from a very practical perspective of how to understand the separation of powers. Uh, but as we study today, we do the Emancipation Proclamation, Merriman, and Youngstown. These are very different positions on executive power and how the courts come across it. All right, bear with me so far. Let's, let's, I'm curious what you guys put for this question. I don't know. Um, let's see. I'm, gu I'm, guessing about, I'm guessing about 50 50. Close, 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 close. Um, I, think, <laughs> I think the slightly better answer is B, but this is a close call. Um, it lists some of the executive powers, but the Constitution doesn't purport to define what the executive power is. And that's a judgment that's come down to history and experience and life. Um, experience and precedent and what past presidents have done in the past is often more important than the text of the Constitution. Okay, uh, Justice Frankfurter has this uh, line in his concurring opinion in Youngstown where he speaks of a gloss where life puts a gloss on the Constitution. We have this practice that goes on and on and on and puts a gloss on the Constitution. <coughs> Shivani, what, what does that mean, a, a gloss on the Constitution? What, what, what's, what, you know, like lip gloss, right? What was that? What, 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 what is Frankfurter getting at there? A gloss in the Constitution. It's an important phrase that, that I probably should make a note about in the book for next edition. I'm always thinking about these things. Gloss. I'll come back to you, Mr. Anyone know what that means, a gloss in the Constitution? What's Frankfurter getting at there? Yeah. Yeah, Stephanie. Um, I kind of read it as like a historical governmental practices. Good. 
Yeah? Uh, someone else had a hand, I saw. Yeah, Mina. I think that Johnson was definitely the gloss. Not that it molds the Constitution, but it, depending on the century and the air and the context and the words, the gloss yeah. kind of dictates how one reads the Constitution. Yeah, I said lip gloss almost jokingly, but that's how I look at it, right? You have the Constitution. The document doesn't change, but practice and what President Sue puts like another layer on top of it. It's, it's thin, it's see-through, but it adds a layer to the Constitution. And every president and every Congress that takes certain actions in response to contemporary crises, the Civil War, or the Korean War, adds layer upon layer to the Constitution. And you'll see this in cases this semester. The court says we have this uh, a practice, this long-standing practice that no one's ever complained about. Right? People keep doing the same thing. The president does this, does this, no one complains. That, for courts, should be very strong evidence that this is now part of the Constitution. Right? It's not that the Constitution changes, it doesn't say that, but the life, the experience, precedent develops this almost secondary constitutional law. And in these major separation of powers decisions, courts put almost as much weight on what Lincoln did, what Roosevelt did, than on what Hamilton said, what Madison said. They look to this practice in a very profound sense. All right? Everyone with me so far? Yes. I think, I think B is the slightly better answer, but, but uh, it's, it's a close call. I think you'll see why now. All right, so questions here. Oh, yeah, Cameron. When comparing you know, as Article 1, Article 2, and maybe um, grammar is not my specialty, but should we note anything how in Article 1 it says all legislative powers? Oh, yeah, and I, mean, I said that a minute ago. Where in the other one just executive Right. Power. No, no, I, I made that point. Powers versus power, right? When you say powers, that means you can count them. 1, 23, 24, whatever the number is, right? The executive power, singular, is like the bundle of sticks. It's this huge mass of power that can't be split up, right? You can't divide it with any specificity. I will note, if you go to Article 3, just to keep, keep it going, Article 3, Section 1, um, it says the judicial power of the United States, not the judicial powers, it says the judicial power. And not the, the judicial power here and granted, it's the judicial power. So the framers at least saw some difference between legislative powers here and granted and the executive power and the judicial power. Because very often courts can do stuff that isn't written down. They can issue orders, injunctions, all the like. Any other questions on this beginning? All right, Shivani, let's go back to you. Let's look at Federal 78 for a minute. I'm sorry, Federal 70. What's Hamilton getting at with Federalist 70? What's, what's he trying to do with this essay? Very good, very good. So, Federal 70 was an essay designed to persuade the people of New York that this new office, this presidency, is a good thing. And you have to understand the backdrop of what just happened. The American people have just fought a bloody revolution against a tyrannical despot, a king. And you can imagine a lot of people in the states weren't so keen on creating this powerful new office, this presidency. As someone mentioned a few minutes ago, under the Articles of Confederation, there wasn't really an executive figure. There was a guy named President. They didn't have any actual powers of worth. This new position, though, was very powerful. Very powerful. And Hamilton doesn't deny it. In fact, Hamilton was a bit of a monarchist himself. He probably wanted president one day. Uh, so he had a vested interest in defending the office. But he's basically saying, look, all right, I'm not going to argue with you. This guy's powerful. It's a powerful office. But that power is essential for a couple reasons. And Shivani, what were the two reasons you said? 
Very good. So he puts forward these two reasons, right? Energy and accountability. And Hamilton says, in an executive, these attributes are essential. And that if an executive doesn't have these attributes, he won't be successful. So, Damon, what's this business of energy? What, why is Hamilton think this is such an important um, attribute of an executive? Good, vigorous, good. Good. Right, Damon says the power to act and to act quickly. That's an important point, right? A legislature, by definition, acts slowly. They deliberate. There are, you know, 500 members of a legislature, right? It takes time to react to problems. And in a legislature, that's a good thing, right? You don't want hastily made laws that no one reads. We never want that, right? <laughs> but with an executive, it's unitary. There's one. And he can act vigorously, that's with, with strength, quickly and decisively, right? You're not going to have a situation where there's a crisis unfolding and you have to persuade a committee to have a vote in five weeks about it. No, no, the executive can take action on his own. So Hamilton thinks there's an importance of having an energetic executive. I think people would probably agree with him. The second one's a little bit more um, <coughs> counterintuitive, Kevin. What's this business of accountability? Why is, why is Hamilton see that such an important attribute for the presidency? So he kind of alludes to, like, in history, where I think, well, he talked about Rome a lot, how there was the consul, so there'd be two main heads of state, and when you have these two central figures, both with equal power, mm -hmm. you, there's gonna be conflict between who says what, and when it comes down to acting, you don't really know who did anything, uh, opposed to if you had like a single figurehead. Very you good. You know what he did, and you can either agree directly with him or disagree directly with him. Very good. So the second attribute is attrib uh, accountability. Um, there was a very common practice, not just in Rome, but in the states, to not have a single governor in a state, but have multiple. A number of states, I think Pennsylvania is one of them, had three panels, I'm sorry, three member panels, right? Where instead of having a single executive, you have three guys in charge. Now, Gabriel, what's the problem with having three people in charge of an entire state for ex ex executive branch? What what's some of the problems that arise with that sort of structure? Uh, it would be like a station in Philly if let's say one of them wants to insert in something and the other two disagree, or if it's a way of the like they want it. One side wants to uh, aim for something, but they're going to go for the people that are uh, supposed to be the other ones. Yeah, so think of it this way, right? I think Gabriel's right on point. If there are three people and you need two of them to agree, right? It's often very unclear who to blame if something goes wrong. Do you blame person one, two, or three? Also, I'll use an easy example. How many of you ever were with, with you know, two other friends, right? And you're trying to pick what movie to see, right? We were trying to pick you know, where to go for dinner or something. And those conversations are of absolutely no importance, right? But they go on for hours and hours. No, I want to see this, I want to see this. And then finally, someone just caves it, fine, whatever, right? Hamlet says that's not a way to run a government, right? You need to have a single person, a unitary executive, who can take decisive action. If the action works, he should be rewarded for it. And here's the key. If it doesn't work out, you know who to blame, right? If a mission fails, if a program flops, the buck stops here. If you know that expression, Harry Truman had to sign us that the buck stops here. Right? If the president fails, you know who to blame. So the problems of having these, these, these panels, these councils, so to speak, is bad because it divides the executive power. Now, the counter-argument to this, of course, is you're vesting a lot of authority, right? And just, just look at the, the language, right? The executive power is vested. By the way, this is called the vesting clause. You want to be cool, the vesting clause, right? You're vesting a lot of power in a single person. And this person will hold his office for four years. Impeachment is possible, but extremely difficult, deliberately so. 
So there's a risk then of giving these powers to individual, but Hamilton says the risk, the risk is worth it. Okay. Um, any questions on Hamilton Federal Seventy? Any questions on Federal Number Seventy? Very important Federals. Yes, Clinton. So there was uh, a lot about energy, energy this, energy that. Oh, yeah. let's get the energetic. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if energy. So I googled and tried to find if energy was had a different meaning at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I've watched your video from last, and I didn't really agree with the idea that energy was just that you want someone who was. Uh, I think what you'll, I don't remember the exact words, but something that was someone who was very authoritative, very take power, mm -hmm. um, the way I read the word energy, that, that was, that was distracting. You know, is there any other of the Federalist Papers where energy is, is put forward like that or any other concept uh, where energy is used? I could look that up after class off the top of my head, but I do not know the answer. Okay. So that's not something, energy, that's the first, that didn't read, that didn't, Oh, that's where that came from. That didn't come into your mind. Well, I knew that because I read this type. You know, it's what I'm looking for. Uh, really... I can look back to class. I can't answer your question. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, Jonathan? Responses be a better word than energetic because when he talks in here about it, it takes many people a long time. It seems like they just want somebody who could react quickly. Quick uh, so time. let me answer your question this way. Um, language, words don't have fixed meanings. And the meaning of words do fluctuate. We've studied commerce, for example, right? Um, the meaning of the word commerce had a very different significance in the 1800s than it does today. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head about energetic. It's possible. Um, there's a very famous dictionary by Robert Johnson. It was from the 1780s. And it's available online. If you want to check Robert Johnson's dictionary to check uh, the meaning of that word, you're welcome to check. And maybe I'll check after class. Um, Justice Scalia had a copy of that on his desk in his office, and he always would, would look words up. He's very proud of that one. Uh, but but there, 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 there's Johnson's Dictionary. There's several others uh, that can give meanings in contemporary time. But I don't know the answer. Yeah, Hannah and Abdul? I'm not really. I mean, I might be completely honest, but when I read that, I thought more of the lack of personal energy that people have in the where they came from before. I mean, King George was Israel, and there's a lack of personal energy. Charisma. That's why I was thinking. I really did energy for charisma that maybe they're trying to replace. Uh, maybe. Abdul? I think the word is decisiveness. Decisiveness? It fits well with, obviously, those, those that are works. Words, but it fits with accountability as well. Right? So someone makes a decision, and they accountable for those decisions. So it, it, those two fit together. I, I love this discussion. I don't know the answer, but I appreciate that you're, you're, you're reading so much of Hamilton. It's very good. OK, anything else? Uh, yes, Rick, Rick Kelly. Duration, yes. Um, I thought it, my reading was it referred to the four-year term in office. That's how I read it. Um, but it could also reflect, reflect the fact that he makes decisions in a quick fashion. Um, you know, it, it's funny. Hamilton is probably one of the clearest writers of his generation, right? I mean, you guys read some of the other stuff. It's... It, it's really tough to understand 18th century writing, right, in your other classes. Hamilton was such a clear writer, yet even then, the concepts he was trying to convey now with an intelligent class 200 years later still up for debate. And you wonder why, in a case like Youngstown, Justice Jackson says, we just don't have a lot to go on, right? He says, there's this one footnote where he says, Hamilton says this in the Federalist, right, and James Madison says that. What, what do we go with that, right? Um, which is why you see these separation of power cases are so tough. They're so little to go on. Um, one more thing. I, I heard it, or I read it from the reading when they were creating this. They had someone like George Washington in mind. Yes. During that time, they yes. were also trying to keep other countries like France and Spain and all of them away. Yes. So would energetic kind of be geared towards that? Right. So that was part of it as well. Everyone assumed that George Washington would be the first executive. I, I mean, it was just... No one had any doubt of who it would be. It was going to be Washington. And he was a person whose character was of a, the highest level. People didn't doubt him. But they were cognizant that Washington only lived for so long. He couldn't be president forever. He would be so chose, right? And someone would have to replace him. 
And at the time, America was in a very precarious situation. You had foreign belligerents. You had England, Sp uh, uh, France, Spain, with all uh, uh, outposts on the, on the continent. And even though you had an armistice, a peace with England, that was fragile. And it would break some, some years later, around 1812. So um, the idea of a strong, energetic executive uh, uh, mattered to keep us safe where if there was a surprise attack on Washington, D.C., and there was, the Washington, D.C. burned down, you couldn't have Congress vote on it because Congress's house was just destroyed, right? <laughs> if you light the Capitol on fire, how are they going to vote on stuff? So there is a value. Uh, Hannah. Um, also, I, I feel similar that, like, federalism was 73, it stands on all of these terms that you list as well. So, like, if anybody wants to purchase I love when students give extra reading. Beautiful. Yeah, definitely. You should. I took a class in law school. Where we read the entire Federalist cover to cover. I wish we had a class like that. It's, it's a good class, but uh, not one I have time for, unfortunately, in this class. But if you want to read them, come talk about it. You're welcome. All right, anything else in Federal 70? Very good discussion. All right. Well, let's move on to the next case. Very important case. Um, ex parte Merriman. And by the way, uh, ex parte or ex parte. That word, what does that mean? It's what's called a habeas corpus suit, right? When you have a prisoner in custody, you're basically bringing suit on behalf of Merriman, right? Merriman wasn't in the court, but someone brought a suit on his behalf. That's what ex parte means, gross oversimplifying. So we'll have cases ex parte Merriman, ex parte Kieran. Uh, uh, you'll see a few of these other decisions this year, but that's what ex parte means. All right, uh, who am I up to? Uh, Taylor, you want to give me the facts, please, in Merriman? Uh -huh. Okay, so why was he arrested? Why was he arrested? Treason. Did he fail to stand it? Never mind. Why was he? Why was he? What? What? What was the treasonous act? <laughs> What what was what was going on here, Taylor? What why what, what was like the background of going on at this time? Amber, what was going on here? Um, there was a military order. Uh, so I think it was. I think it was civil war time. You think? Yeah, it was civil war. Okay, time. good. So this is a civil war. But what what exactly was Merriman arrested for? What was the what was the allegation? Can the cops just pick up and arrest whoever they want? No. Okay, so as a general matter, Amber, if, if the police want to arrest you, what do they have to demonstrate? Do they, have, do they have probable cause? Very good, right? So as a general matter, under the Constitution, if the police or anyone else want to arrest you, they have to show their probable cause to make the arrest. Now, uh, Juliana, I'll ask the same question again. What was the basis for the arrest of Merriman? Um, it was pretty vague. Yeah. Um, had the right. Okay. So here's what was going on. You had the Civil War, right? Um, so there's a map up here. No, the map up here. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Um, you had the Civil War going on. Um, everyone thinks it was North versus South, and all the Northern states were free, and all the Southern states were slave. Uh, that wasn't accurate. Um, there were border states, for example, the state of Maryland, the Kentucky, right? These were states that had slavery and were very much in favor of slavery, but they didn't secede. They stayed in the Union. Okay, they were loyal to the Union. <laughs> Maryland in particular is an important state for geography. Why? It formed a buffer with Virginia, which was the capital of the Confederacy, and also the District of Columbia is right around here. Okay, so it's a very important strategic location. Merriman was, particularly, a Southern sympathizer. Exactly what he did, the court doesn't know, which is precisely the point. Merriman was arrested and locked up in Fort McHenry. <coughs> right, Fort McHenry was in Baltimore. Okay. What happened next is a little bit fuzzy. 
but we know he was arrested in May of 1861. He was arrested under the orders of General George Cadwallader. Um, that day, Merriman's attorneys presented a petition for habeas corpus in Roger Tawney's home in Washington, right? Forget electronic filing. They just showed up at Tawney's home, and they gave him this petition saying, look, our, our guy Merriman has been locked up. Tawney issued a writ of habeas corpus directing the head of the fort to produce Merriman's body, right? That's what habeas corpus means. Corpus, like Corpus Christi, body, habeas, deliver. They said, bring the body of Merriman for a hearing the next day. Now, it's unclear in what capacity Tawny was even doing any of this stuff. Um, there's a little note in this after the case. My colleague, Seth Barrett Tillman, has written about this. No one ever thought about this, but Seth is right. Um, this wasn't an appeal, right? This case was an appeal to the Supreme Court. And although Tawny was a circuit justice for Maryland, they didn't follow the normal procedures. So it's not even clear in what capacity Tawny was acting. I don't think he had jurisdiction to do what he was doing. He probably knew that. But it was a very weird opinion. Okay? Now, again, Tawny never ordered that Mary must be released, only to bring him to court. And they had less than 24 hours notice. This case is often taught, and the textbook I used to use that made this point, that Abraham Lincoln ignored Tawney's order. Um, it's simply not true, and it's not true for a few reasons. First, Tawney never ordered that Merriman be released. Therefore, there's no order to be ignored. Right? You can't ignore an order that doesn't exist. Also, it's unclear if Lincoln was even aware of this. He was never served process. He wasn't a party to litigation. He may not have even know what was going on. Now, going back to the case, it's very dramatic. Lincoln told the general, bring the body, right? Bring Merriman to my court tomorrow. The general declined. You know, he's like, you know, I'm kind of busy fighting a war here. I can't go to your stupid little court. Pretty much. Instead, he sent his aide, a colonel, who gave Tawny a letter. And the letter says that Merriman was charged with acts of treason. Treason is a high crime, right? Armed hostility against the government, association with organized force that was the Confederacy, and he was engaged in rebellion. These are really serious charges, but there was no, no facts, right? Just, just asserted, right? And the letter said that the uh, colonel as the authority uh, pursuant to the president. <laughs> Right, the president authorized him to suspend this writ of habeas corpus for public safety. So the general saying, I am authorized by President Lincoln to take these actions. The letter says, the general requests that you postpone further action upon this case until the general can receive more instruction from the president. So what did Tawney do? Tawney held Merriman, I'm sorry, Tawney issued the order of the general in contempt of court. What does it mean contempt of court? If you ignore a court order, the court holds you in contempt. What does that mean? They can fine you or they can imprison you. Right? If you, if you go to a judge, say, judge, I'm not going to follow your order. The judge can say, okay, I'm going to throw you in jail for a couple of days. How do you feel about that? That's an awesome power if you think about it, right? The judge on his own accord can hold you in jail. The problem is, how in the, how in the hell? Right? How on earth? Was, the, was Tawny supposed to throw this general who's in this huge fort in jail? It didn't work. So uh, Tawny actually sent his marshal. This, this is a crazy story. I just want you to think about it, right? Poor Tawny, right, sends his marshal <coughs> to Fort McHenry, this humongous fort in Baltimore. <laughs> the guy's knocking on the door. It's like, hi, I have an order to place the General Union Army under arrest. Can you imagine, right? Tawny sends his guy to this humongous fort and says, I want to place the head of the Union Army under arrest indefinitely. So unsurprisingly, the marshal was not able to enter the fort <laughs> to, to, to arrest the general, right? You know, who's surprised by that? Then Tawny, this gets even crazier, authorized the marshal to summon the posse comitatus. What the hell is a posse comitatus? It's basically a group of hooligans, more or less, right? A group of the people who can storm the fort and seize control 
of the general and to arrest him. This is like, this is crazy just when you think about the chronology. But then Tawny said, you know what? I'm going to excuse the marshal uh, because the power refusing obedience was so notoriously superior to any the marshal could command. I just spoke about this, right? The court says we want to put you under arrest and no one lets him put him under arrest. What's the court's authority worth at that point? An important question. So at that point, the subsequent proceedings were not about merriment. They were about contempt for the general and the inability of the marshal to serve the contempt order. So at the very end, right, we'll get to the very end of the opinion later, but at the very end, Tawny made arrangements for the letter, I'm sorry, for the opinion to be sent to the president so that the president might perform his constitutional duty to enforce the laws by securing obedience to the process of the United States. Now, Lincoln never did anything about this. In fact, he may never have known about it. Okay. Uh, as it turns out, Merriman was detained at Fort McHenry until he was transferred uh, uh, by uh, federal authorities. He was indicted for treason in 1861 and then was released on bail shortly thereafter. Uh, after the end of the war, the government dismissed charges against him. They were brought to trial. So all this basically went nowhere. Uh, as it turned out, Merriman sued General Cadwallader for false imprisonment. Uh, it didn't work. Um, but the, the story, what matters, what we're going to be talking about, beyond the dramatic, you know, very dramatic situation, did Lincoln have the power to suspend habeas corpus? Did General Cadwalder have this authority from the president to do this? Right? That's, that's our question, right? So I think, Ashley, I think you're next. Ashley, what's Tawny's argument about whether Lincoln, the president, and, and by extension the general, had the power to suspend the writ of habeas corpus? Um, he said that he didn't have the power to do that, that okay. it was a legislative power given to Congress. Okay, where does he get this from? Okay, very good. So, Tawny makes a few points, right? He makes an argument based on the text of the con excuse me, on the text of the Constitution and also on history and practice of the Constitution. So, let's start with the text, right? Article 1, Section 9. It says, The privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may be so, at the outset, the framers recognized that this writ of habeas corpus, that you can go to a judge to challenge your detention, right, it can be suspended, but in only certain circumstances. If there's a case of rebellion or invasion, in those cases, the public safety may require it. Rebellion or invasion. Okay, so Sophia, why, we have a civil war going on, right? War of northern aggression, right? <laughs> why, why is that not triggered, right? Why can't habeas corpus be suspended in light of the uh, hostilities? <laughs> um, well, in Article 1, Section 9, it says that it, uh, the suspension doesn't exactly say who has it. Oh, it doesn't, does it? It doesn't say who. So why... Well, what does Tawny say here? What's Tawny's argument? So, because it's not listed in the Constitution, he's going beyond his powers that are fully given. Who does Tawny think that the power of suspension belongs to? Congress. Why do you think it's Congress? Uh, because it's under Article One. Exactly. Right. So we studied this the first day of class, right? Article One lists all of Congress's powers, and Tawny makes what I think is a fairly logical point. If all these uh, congressional powers are listed in Article One, and the habeas corpus argument is uh, articles listed in Article One, this should be viewed as Congress's powers. Laura, what does Lincoln say about that? Lincoln has a response to this. He, he I mean, Lincoln didn't respond to Tawney, but he, he ultimately got around to this discussion. What does Lincoln say here? 
Well, you know, if you know, yes, what do you think Lincoln would say about this? Well, he ignored his opinion completely. Well, what's Lincoln's reading? Does Lincoln say that this means Congress has the power? Lincoln addresses this well, later in Emancipation. I know, but does Lincoln, uh, focus on this one point. Does Lincoln say that the Constitution says Congress has this power alone? No. What does, what does Lincoln say? Um, what do you think he would say here? That it was at the time of emergencies. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to Chaz. What, what would Lincoln say here? If the Constitution's silent on who has his power, how should the courts interpret it? As either Congress having it or the president having it? How should courts read it? Well, uh, Lincoln would probably say that Congress doesn't, if it doesn't explicitly say in the, con I mean in, in the Constitution, then Congress does not have it, so the president has it. Very good, right? And I'll just twist it a little bit, right? Well, Lincoln says this in the Emancipation. The Constitution is silent about who has his power. Maybe it's for Congress, maybe it's for the president, maybe it's concurrent, right? Maybe they can both exercise it. But in any event, if the Constitution doesn't say strictly it's for Congress alone, then the court should not rule that. And the court should give a loose interpretation such that the president, in his own judgment, in the event of invasion or rebellion, can exercise this, right? Uh, Mina, let me ask you this question. What happens if, you know, there is an invasion and Britain burns down the capital and Congress can't meet. Does that mean habeas corpus could never be suspended? No. Well, why not? Well, that would just be ridiculous. Well, why is it ridiculous? <laughs> because that would be saying that Ah, and this is Lincoln's point about energy, right? Well, however you want to define energy, this is one of them. Say there's an emergency, there's an invasion, and the Capitol's burned down, and all the members of Congress are, you know, burned alive, God forbid, right? The, the designated survivor, right? They're all gone. Would it really be the rule that the president would be disabled from suspending habeas corpus in that situation? If the president wants to lock up all the suspected uh, arsonists, people who live on fire? Is that possible the rule? Mina says that that wouldn't make sense. That'd be crazy. Arlene, what's the response to that? Is it so crazy that 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 you let the executive suspend habeas corpus unilaterally? Is that so nuts? So the opposite thing is that? Yes, ma'am. Um, no, because then what's the limit on that? Um, uh, what kind of, I mean, what else could they be added within their policy? Very good, right? That, that's very good. So the flip side, right, is the frames were very cautious about this habeas corpus being suspended. They lived through a regime where the king of England would routinely suspend process and lock people up overseas without any process. Were they really willing to give this king, this president, this power? Okay. So the text, right, doesn't cut one way or the other. But depending what values you put on it, you can go the tawny route, or the Lincoln route. I'm not saying either one's right or wrong. Jonathan, was your hand up a minute ago? Yeah, but doesn't that go back to the Federalist thing of like, okay, well, he can do it, but if we don't like it, then he's accountable for it. He probably won't get reelected. Well, Lincoln was almost impeached for this. Had Lincoln survived the assassination attempt, he probably would have been impeached for this. There was a, I mean, there was a significant historical movement that Lincoln was violating the Constitution. Like, re Really big. There was this, there was this uh, book called um, The Impeachment of Abraham Lincoln. It was historical fiction, but it imagined that Lincoln survived the assassination attempt, and there was actually an impeachment trial for this. For ex parte? For, for suspending habeas corpus unilaterally. So, accountability, you're right. I mean, he, he died with the bullet, but this could have ended him. But yeah, everyone knew when Lincoln issued the suspension order. It was a public act. There's definitely accountability. Um, uh, Lauren, one other point, though. Tawny doesn't only base his decision on text. He also looks at history. What historical practice do we have here that's you know, really relevant from a prominent member of the, uh, of, of the founding generation? 
What, 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 what does he look to? It's a very um, important episode in American history. A very, a very prominent episode. You don't know what I'm talking about? What is it? Yeah, Donnie, you can go there. Yeah. Is it um, uh, the, the, the situation between Aaron Burr and uh, yeah. Jefferson? Yeah. So, I mean, Aaron Burr, right, this is the guy who killed Alexander Hamilton in a duel. He was the vice president of the United States, and he was engaged in legit treason, right? He was trying to overthrow and start this other country. It was, the, the guy was nuts, right? It, it was, it's a crazy story. Um, but Jefferson presided, I'm sorry, was president as it was an impeachment trial. I'm sorry, as a, uh, there was a treason trial that was brewing. And Jefferson considered suspending the writ during the conspiracy trial because they were conspirators. He had associates, and they didn't know where they were. And they wanted to arrest all of Burr's associates. They didn't have enough cause. And Jefferson says, I can't suspend habeas corpus. It's for Congress to do it. All right, so Lauren, I'll go back to you. What should we make of it that Jefferson, right, the, the third president of the United States, prominent member of the founding generation, wasn't a framer. Well, he was in France during the, during the convention, but very prominent guy, right? He's saying that it's for the Congress, not the executive. So how should we do this? Lincoln says one thing, he can do it. Jefferson says the other one, he can't. How... How's the court supposed to resolve this? You have Lincoln on the one hand, you have Jefferson on the other. How are you supposed to resolve that? I think that because that happened before, so that they might go with the president doesn't have that power. So what's the relevance that Jefferson did it in the 1800s and then Lincoln said the other thing in the 1860s? What, which, which is more authoritative? Why? Why, why would the Jefferson practice be more relevant than the uh, Lincoln practice? Does that want to take a step? Uh, I'm sorry? Lost. Oh, I like how you answered that. So Jefferson, by not exercising a power, put a gloss in the Constitution, right? And this is a practice closer in time to the framing but perhaps this was understood better than to say. The same way the word energy might have had a different definition today as 100 years ago. Maybe the framers in that generation understood what this meant, and maybe Lincoln didn't. Abdul? Maybe I could say originalism. It, it goes to perhaps originalism, but even more so, it's a, a practice that was fairly early on. Now, the flip side, when Jefferson decided not to suspend the writ, you know, the Republic was fairly stable. There was a risk of this Burr conspiracy, but like, you know, the Republic wasn't being torn in half. And Donnie just went, so Sh Sh Shara, in contrast, when Lincoln did it, what was going on? These were, these were not good times. And what would have happened if Lincoln didn't suspend the writ, at least if you ask Lincoln? What would have happened to the Republic if he couldn't do these sorts of things? Out of hand, be a little bit more precise. All, all these writs being just kind of thrown around. And... Yeah, what would have happened if the court started supervising the prosecution of the Civil War? Yeah. So Lincoln made this point, and he made this point very openly, that he took an oath to protect, support, and defend the Constitution. And he said, he made this point in his statement very well, what's the point of having a Constitution if the Union fails? Right? If the union falls apart, what good is this? It's a piece of paper right, in your pocket. I went to the cleaner, so I had another one. But you know, it's the same thing. right? Um, occasionally, the cleaner is like, you figure your passport in your pocket. I'm like, yes, thank you. Um, but what's the point of having a written constitution if the union falters? So Lincoln was largely what you might call necessity defense, you know, the necessity doctrine of torts. Right? You got to sometimes do something illegal to save yourself. And here Lincoln was trying to save the Union. Um, but this was wildly controversial, this idea. Because what if you have a person whose character was not as you know, honest as Abe, so to speak, right? You had someone who wasn't so straightforward as Lincoln, but you had a tyrant, you had a despot, right? 
Because whatever powers you give to Lincoln, you give to someone else who may not like what they're doing. Jonathan? I'm just curious why Lincoln couldn't, because in the Fifth Amendment it says in times of war you can specifically do this. You can do what? And except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia or in an actual service in a time of war or public danger. That's for grand jury indictment. Is it really just textually, just strictly like that when everything else is read intertextually? Couldn't I just apply that to other parts? The, the, uh, the Fifth Amendment, which Jonathan's reading, refers to grand jury indictments. And grand jury indictments can be suspended. But there's a difference between a grand jury indictment and holding someone indefinitely without charging them, right? What a grand jury indictment means, you can charge them without uh, having to go through the grand jury process. Here, it's you're not even charging them for crimes. It's a very different act. You're holding him indefinitely. He was held for, for you know, basically a year and never tried for anything. Probably trumped up charges. But again, the point that I want you to understand is um, these are not easy questions, right? The textually, Tawny is probably right. As a matter of gloss, I think the Jefferson example is probably right. But then we act on necessity, right? And would the union have stood if this was not permitted? Right? If federal judges could, could, could tell the general, you have to release him, you have to come here, what would that have done? Um, Tawny had no hesitation with, with basically sending his poor little marshal to arrest the general, right? It wasn't going to work, but he wanted to make a point. Like, I, 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 I've been to Fort McHenry. It, it, this place is humongous. Go to Baltimore. It, it's really big. And just imagine some, some poor guy, knock, knock, who's there? Marshal. Marshal, I want to arrest your general. Get the hell out of here, right? <laughs> He's lucky he didn't get shot. Um, but I, just, I want you to picture that in your mind when you think about the power of the courts and how impotent they are, unless the executive branch backs them up, right? Unless you have someone willing to actually serve the writ and arrest the general, his opinion is just paper. doesn't have any teeth. OK. All right, so any other questions on, on Merriman? Yeah, what? I was just curious, you had said kind of the start of talking about this, that um, no one really knew like what authority Tanny was Tawny. acting on, or Tawny, excuse yep. me, was acting on. But when you mentioned the Judiciary Act of 17. Oh, our favorite, yeah. Like, wouldn't that give Tanny the authority at least to like bring Merriman to review for the, I mean, like why? Yeah, so. The Judiciary Act of 1789 gives certain judges the power to writ issue writs of habeas corpus. It's not clear if Tawny fell within that category, because they basically delivered the papers to his house, right? They didn't follow the normal procedure of seeking a writ of habeas corpus. So in theory, a federal judge in Maryland could have done this. It's unclear if Tawny was that person. Uh, yes, Kevin. I just had a quick question on the gloss example and the inherent power. So I guess Article 2 defines a shell sort of, of what the president can and can't do, but there's this whole notion of history behind what the president has, presidents have historically done. So is that basically saying the president can do, can do something, and depending on how Congress or the courts react to it, is whether or not they're going to allow him to go forward. So he just, he just acts, and then based on history, either it's going to happen or it's not. So the general rule, right, Youngstown and Merriman are the outliers. The general rule is that when you have these separation of powers cases, the president wins. Generally, courts are really hesitant to interfere in this process because there's so little to go on. Youngstown and Merriman are the absolute outliers. So generally, when the president does something, that's the end of it. Even in Youngstown, they reference, well, President Roosevelt sees this and sees that. There were no court challenges, right? There are cases where the president loses, but those are the outliers. More often than not, courts just won't get involved at all. They'll say, this is the political process, not for us. Yeah, Chief. Uh, so post 9-11, when it was pretty much a witch hunt for anybody that- Witch uh, hunt, yeah. Well, I say, I say it was a witch hunt to an extent, but when there were, I, I remember I was a lot younger at the time, but I remember reading about people that were just, if basically someone would say they were a terrorist and they had, you know, a uh, certain ethnic background, and so all of a sudden they would be able to get taken from their homes without any real reason other than the hearsay of, oh, 
they're affiliated with terrorism. Did that play a role? Did, was so I, I don't know if it was ever quite that bad, but it, but it got pretty bad. So there was one example um, where after 9-11, in New York City, uh, hundreds of Arab men were just rounded up and detained for long periods of time. Um, in fact, just last year, the Supreme Court considered a lawsuit where um, a couple of those guys had brought um, what are called Bivens lawsuits, seeking damages against federal officials for their detentions. And the Supreme Court threw them out. Um, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, those things did go on. Um, over the years afterwards, in the Guantanamo Bay cases, the court started questioning the power to detain people indefinitely. In fact, that issue is still ongoing. Okay. Um, I don't think I assigned any of the Guantanamo cases this year. They're, they're, uh, we can do it if you want. But, but they're, 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 they're more statutory than constitutional, so I, don't, I try not to teach them if I don't have to. But um, these issues do go on um, wh when the government can detain someone. Um, the reason why those cases are a little bit different is there was an authorization for use of force by Congress which allowed them to be detained. The magic question is, uh, that was an authorization for force against Al-Qaeda in Iraq, can you use it to detain ISIS fighters? That's actually a much tougher question. Ooh. I might cover that, I think. I think I might actually do. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry? Yeah. Yeah, so the court marshals in a very unique position. They do they do have an executive power, but they work for the court. So it's a weird, like a hybrid almost. I, I like your question. Um, but <clears throat> I don't think the general has any sort of chain of command over a uh, court martial. Yeah, Trey? Well, the fact that he was both a judge and a justice, um, but he was willing to take the narrow judgment of the Thank you. I, again, I'm, I'm going to duck your question a little bit. It's unclear what capacity issues this decision, right? People have been saying this for 100 years. The answer is not clear, right? He basically said, uh, file this in the district court for the Circuit of Maryland, and he signed it as circuit justice. But it, I'll, I'll answer the question this way. There was a process for someone detained in Maryland to seek a writ of habeas corpus. They didn't follow it, right? They filed it with Tawny as home in Washington, D.C., they, they didn't use a normal process, so I'll leave it there. But it was weird. He didn't do, it, it, this wasn't the normal process at all. Who is they when you refer to the who? Merriman's lawyers. Oh. Yeah, I think I mentioned this earlier. Merriman's lawyers went to Tawny's house in DC. They just yeah. showed up and they said, here, Mr. Chief Justice, let him go. Um, Tawny, I mean, I'll, I'll mention this now, um, was the author of the Dred Scott decision, which we'll read in a couple weeks. Uh, he was a supporter of slavery. Uh, he sold his own slaves and let them free. Um, he emancipated them, but he was a supporter of slavery as a Marylander. Um, the lawyers from Maryland knew, knew they get a favorable hearing from him. Also, Tawny hated Lincoln. Um, there's, this, there's this great quote. Let me... Uh, uh, yeah. So... Just get the chronology straight, right? Tawny writes the opinion Dred Scott. Abraham Lincoln runs for the presidency and decision, I'm sorry, Lincoln runs for president saying Dred Scott's wrong, right? The basis of Lincoln's campaign for the presidency is that Tawny got the Constitution wrong and that this decision should not be extended. Then Lincoln wins. Who issues the oath of office to Lincoln? Tawny. And um, at the time, Tawny was 83. And here's Lincoln's quote. I love this quote. He says, I saw the withered form of Chief Justice Tawny, the author of the famous Dred Scott decision, that judicial compend of the doctrine of slavery administer the oath of office, right? So it was this weird scene where Lincoln had run on office, trashing the guy. And then Tawny swears him in. Um, Tawny... Uh, this is actually his bust in the Supreme Court. If you ever go, you can see it. Um, he's been uh, brought under a lot of disrepute in recent years, where actually monuments and busts of his have been removed. There's one in Frederick, Maryland, his hometown. A bucket, a bucket of paint was poured on it, and they actually removed the statue. There was another statue from outside the Maryland Capitol in Annapolis that was also removed later, early this year. 
basically lifted up in the dark of night. Um, I've written and quoted this. I think at some point people will try to remove him from the Supreme Court. Probably won't work because he's there because of his role as Chief Justice, not because of anything he wrote. Uh, but that's still there at the Supreme Court. Uh, other fun fact: uh, there's a depiction of Prophet Muhammad in the Supreme Court. He's up there. So there's a there's a there's a sculpture of all various lawgivers. There's Moses and Solomon and Hammurabi, and there's a picture of the Prophet Muhammad in there. Uh, in fact, there was actually a fatwa about 20 years ago saying, okay, it's fine, just leave it there. Uh, but there was a serious movement to get that taken down. There's also a naked butt up there. Because um, there was a case involving um, uh, uh, depictions of, uh, of uh, obscenity and pornography and, and you know, things like that. And one of the ju lawyers said, and there's a, there's a buttocks in the Supreme Court. You can actually see it. It's up there. Uh, so there's a lot of fun, fun architecture. Anyone ever been to the Supreme Court? You've been? Were you there for a hearing or just visiting? Uh, just visiting. Well, if you ever get to go on a on an argument day, it's a uh, it's a lot of fun. I'll probably be there at least once or twice this year. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So to extend the chronology, so he was chief justice, and then now during this, he's not chief justice. He anymore. no, he he still is. Oh, during ex parte Merriman? Yeah. Oh. He died a couple years later, I think in '63 or '64, and then Lincoln appointed point, his successor, Simon Chase, who was the great abolitionist. So Lincoln buried that, literally. Right, the questions on Merriman, very important case. Very important case. All right. Now let's talk about the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, this is something which students have heard of, um, but they don't actually know what it is. Um, you know, I think I learned this when I was in middle school. Lincoln freed the slaves, right? Isn't that what we all learned? Uh, no, 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 not, not quite. Uh, uh, how you next? So talking, what did the Emancipation Proclamation do. So it, I guess it says it serves three purposes. It okay. serves slaves in the Confederate forced control areas. Good. The red, right. right? So it only freed them in the red territories. The blue were the border states. It did not emancipate slaves in the border states. It only emancipated them in the red. And bizarrely, there were a few parishes in Louisiana. I haven't tracked them exactly. But there are a few parishes in Louisiana that were apparently loyal to the Union. Also, you have this fake state of West Virginia, which is not a real state, uh, uh, but, but, but West Virginia was considered, you know, basically non-aggressive. Okay, so Hannah, go on. What else did the emancipation do? Um, and, the to north, and then what happens if they move north? Um, that they would be free. And, and, and what could they do? And they could join on. Yeah, that was the biggie, right? Mm -hmm. That if the slaves in the border states managed to join the <laughs> army, they'd be emancipated. And if slaves in the southern states made it north, they would be free. Now, wait a minute. Didn't we do a case on this? Derek, didn't we do a case on this? What happens to runaway slaves? What, what, what's Lincoln doing here? Prig. Yeah, and what did that case hold? That case, it was a guy who was a state actor. Yeah. Yeah. So the court upheld the Future Slave Act, right? Which said if a runaway slave goes north, he has to return back south. This is ignoring all that, right? This is saying, we're gonna just, you know, let, if you make it north, you'll be free. You'll be joining the army and you'll be emancipated. And so will your families. Now, you haven't studied Dred Scott yet. So I'll give you a preview of the decision. The, the court held in no small part that people of African descent were not citizens, could never be citizens, and indeed were chattel, were property. And Chief Justice Taney, who wrote Dred Scott, looked to the Fifth Amendment, right, that says, nor shall private property be taken without just compensation. And Taney said, if the federal government tries to emancipate a slave, it's a taking of property, which requires compensation. Right. Lincoln had run for president saying that Dred Scott was wrong. And he did it in a very peculiar way. What he said was, well, you have this case, Dred Scott v. Sanford, right? Involving two parties. The federal government was not party to that case. Therefore, the federal government's not bound by the decision. Whoa. Whoa, right? Reese Judicata, what? If you're not a party to the case, Lincoln said, you're not bound by the judgment. So he says, look, 
The US, US, United States was not party to Dred Scott, so we're not bound by it. So what Lincoln's basically saying is that I have the power to emancipate the slaves, and it does not amount to a taking of property which would require compensation to be paid. Okay? But that only goes to the issue of compensation. Jake, let me ask this question. Why did Lincoln only focus on the, the red, the, uh, the, the rebel territories, not the border states or the, uh, or the other states? Okay. What difference does that make? Why did, why did Lincoln focus only on the red states? Red, as it were, yeah, but the red states. What, Jake, let me ask the question differently. What power did Lincoln rely on to seize? The war power. Good. Tell me more about this war power. Um, some Article 2, Section 2. Okay. And what it says, the president shall be commander in chief of the army and navy of the United States, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so Ryan, does that say the president can seize property? No. No. It implies. What does that mean? It implies. Well, it says if it's a fit and necessary measure for suppressing the rebellion, that he's capable of doing it. Ah, now wait a minute. Had Congress declared war here, Ryan, on the South? No. No. And this is an important point. Lincoln insisted till his dying day, I think it's his dying day, right? That there was never a civil war. You notice he doesn't call it a civil war. He calls it rebellion, right? Insurrection, etc. In his mind, the southern states were still part of the Union, but they were under rebellion governments, right? They were rebelling. There was insurrection. So he says that my commander in chief powers are activated by this rebellion. <coughs> Is that necessarily the case? Jonathan, does a rebellion trigger the commander in chief powers? Would you need a declaration of war? Yes. Why do you say yes? Yeah, this is the take care clause, right? Lincoln argues to keep the Union alive, I need to exercise these powers. It was very much a necessity doctrine, right? But Clinton, but that doesn't answer the question, though, right? How does the power to be commander-in-chief of the army give him the power to seize and emancipate slaves? We're, we're, what's the, the basis of that authority there? I'm going to use an example. Let's say I'm commanding an army and I come across some ammunition oh. uh, as part of that army. I'm going to take that ammunition and, and take part of it. That's the property of my, my opponent. So yeah. we use the same thing. So he saw these slaves as property of the South, and he said, hey, I'm going to take them, put them into my fort, uh, make them free. That's going to take away some of their economics. It, I'm not sure what his mindset was, but the first thing is he puts them into the North Army. Obviously, he's got more assets there. So he used the slaves, interpreted as property, to ensure that he could take them under wartime without getting around the, the Fifth Amendment. Right. Very good. So... There's an irony to the Emancipation Proclamation. The irony is this. Lincoln freed the slaves by treating them as property. Right? It's, it's, it's ironic to a huge degree, right? That in order to emancipate the slaves, he had to treat them as chattel, which is what Dred Scott said they were. And uh, anyone ever see Gone with the Wind, the movie? Remember he had like the barn and like the Union soldiers came and basically seized the barn and they took whatever food was inside, right? Remember these scenes? Uh, Clinton's exactly right. Lincoln said, we are treating these people as rebel property. The same way if we came across uh, a warehouse of gunpowder or a warehouse of, of rifles or, 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 or a, you know, a farm with food, we're going to take it under our military power. And then once the property was taken and put in the um, uh, custody of the United States government, that's when they emancipated them, gave them freedom, let them join the army, as it were free their families as well, right? So the Emancipation Proclamation was extremely significant, right? For slaves in the rebel territories, I'm sorry, in, 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 in the rebel territories, as well as for some of them in the border states. In fact, Lincoln was 
um, galvanize and, and lionize as a hero, but the base of it is just, I, you know, it gets me very really, like, to, to free the slaves, you have to treat them as property. Now, one other bit, I don't think it's in your book, but it probably should be. Um, a lot of slave owners were not happy about this, as you could imagine. And they actually brought takings actions against the federal government. They actually sued the federal government for saying, you took my property without providing compensation. This was not a trivial argument. And there was a sincere worry that judges would start ordering the payment of compensation for the slaves. So there's actually a section of the 14th Amendment, which no one ever reads. No one ever gets this far, right? I'm going to read you section 4 of the 14th Amendment. It says, neither the United States nor any state shall assume or pay any debt or obligation incurred in aid of insurrection rebellion against the United States or any claim for the loss or emancipation of any slaves. All such debts, obligations, and claims will be held illegal and void. What does that mean? The government can't be sued for the cost of emancipating slavery. Right? They were actually, the framers of the 14th Amendment were probably lawyers, and they knew this might come up in years in the future. So they tried to basically um, uh, insulate Lincoln from lawsuits. You know, Lincoln was already dead at this point. But they're trying to insulate the government for Lincoln's actions. Okay? So again, Lincoln freed the slaves under the war power, right? Even though there's no declaration, it was based on this insurrection. And he did it by determining that the slaves were rebel property that had to be seized, dispatched to the Northern Union to help the economy, help the war effort, and also cripple the South. Right? It was, it was, it was a, I mean, the emancipation, it reads like a legal document, right? When you read it, it reads like a, like a legal document. Lincoln was, of course, a lawyer. He'd argue for the Supreme Court. He had a very um, distinct view of the Constitution. And he tried to execute that in many respects, uh, although he did so in ways that are um, astounding if you actually put them into context. So any questions on the Emancipation Proclamation? On Lincoln's Emancipation? Questions on Lincoln? All right, Evan, what's Justice Curtis's objections? And by the way, um, we'll do this later, but Justice Curtis was one of the two dissenters in Dred Scott. And he actually resigned from the court because of his utter disgust with Taney's opinion. So again, Curtis was no slavery supporter. He was an abolitionist. But he could not accept, Evan, this emancipation. What was his objection? What was his beef with this emancipation? He thought it violated the Constitution uh, just because uh, Abraham Lincoln was acting in this time of war, he was worried that you know, this, this would allow him to do uh, other drastic measures. Yeah, right. So he says, if during the time of war, the POTUS, the, POTUS, the president has, let's see, I want to read my notes, the president has an implied constitutional right to disregard other positive prohibitions, he has the same right to disregard them at other times. Right? How do you limit this? Once you allow the executive to deviate from the normal rules, how do you bring them back in? You say, well, only for so long as there's a crisis. Well, how long did a crisis last? The Civil War was a few years. Reconstruction was decades. And if a president knows when there's a crisis, he gets these extra powers, he manufacture a crisis. It's true. This was a reference in the... Um, in the Youngstown case, right, where under the German Constitution, the Weimar Constitution, following World War I, the, the Chancellor, the President, could suspend the laws in times of a crisis. And this was done over and over again until the very last time where Hitler, right, the actual Hitler, not like, you know, actual Hitler said, suspend the laws, and they never went back into effect. So when you allow the suspensions in the times of war, they may not ever go back to normal. Because once you allow an exercise of authority, it creates a gloss. And it creates a precedent. And if Lincoln did it, why can't Hitler do it, or Mussolini, or whoever it happens to be? Now, I'm not saying Hitler is Mussolini and Lincoln, they're all the same. No, I'm not saying that. You're going to quote me on that, but that's not what I'm saying. But when you have 
uh, an honorable president, and you give him certain latitude, and a future president that's not so honorable might not do it. One of the tests which you often have to ask yourself is, imagine that a president you don't like does the same things Lincoln did, right? Imagine a president you don't like doing something you really hate, exercise the power that Lincoln did, see if you still uh, support it. It's a good way to reality check yourself. It's a hard, hard question. Okay, any other questions on the Emancipation Proclamation? Any other questions on the Emancipation Proclamation? Nothing? No? Okay, I'll move on. All right, so the remainder of the class, we'll talk about Youngstown. This is probably the most important decision of the 20th century. I don't say that lightly, but it's probably up there. Uh, more important than Brown or Hormatsu or anything else. This is, this is probably the most significant one. And the reason why it was a separation of powers case where the court ruled against the president, right, in a very significant fashion. Okay. Uh, Jeffrey, you want to give me the facts who's in Youngstown? Not sure. No, so this occurred during the Korean War. And what happened was there, um, the workers were about to try and stage a strike, dis uh -huh. disagreements, unions, all that. And they, the government tried to help them negotiate it. It didn't go so well. And a few days before they were going to strike, uh, the president authorized to have all the steels taken to keep up the war effort. OK, very good. So um, I find that students don't even know what the Korean War or the Korean conflict is. In fact, the Olympics start in Korea tomorrow. Um, why is there a North and South Korea? Okay, it begins with World War II. Uh, after World War II, uh, we had something called the Cold War, right? <clears throat> where there were countries that were in line with the United States, and there were other countries in line with the Soviet Union. In fact, the phrase third world nation means they were lined with neither. That's what the phrase actually meant originally. So you had the northern part of the Korean Peninsula was allied with the Soviet Union, and you had the southern part of the Korean Peninsula, which was allied with the United States. So they basically made a line that was, aha, the 38th parallel, right? Now, they're not technically two countries. They, don't, they will never acknowledge that, but they became two separate countries. You have the Republic of Korea, that's South Korea, and the Democrats People Republic of Korea, which is North Korea. Um, now, for God, five decades, North Korea is ruled by dictators, one after the other. Uh, South Korea is a fairly prosperous nation. Um, this triggered war. No. Congress never declared war in Korea. There was no declaration. Instead, there was a UN resolution. Now, what, what's the UN? The United Nations was a, uh, a group of countries formed following World War II to try to keep world peace. I don't know. Um, the United States joined the UN as part of a treaty. President Truman sent American troops abroad, not based on a declaration, but based on the obligations under this treaty. Is that permissible? Before you shake your head yes, realize the war in Korea never ended. Um, there's a non-trivial argument that the president today could send troops to Korea under the same authority as Truman did 50 years ago. Before we say yes, think about that again. You're all of draft age. Uh, <laughs> um, you're in college, probably not. But um, uh, during the arguments, Justices Jackson and Frankfurt reminded the government that uh, this was not a declared war. But uh, this came up. So North Korea invaded the South in 1950. The United States sent 340,000 troops to this mission. That's a lot of people. And then China to the war, and the Soviets provided aid to the North, and the Chinese were involved. Eventually, there's an armistice sign, but the war didn't actually ever finish. That's why you saw this demilitarized zone, this DMZ between the two countries. Now, that was what was going on overseas. Back home at the high of the war, there was a threatened labor strike, right? Um, the steel workers wanted higher wages. The steel owners said, no way. They couldn't work it out. President Truman, remember the buck stops here, right? Ordered the government to seize the steel mills. In fact, who's Sawyer, right? 
Sawyer was the, uh, there's actually a picture of the, of the mill in Ohio. It's been abandoned since this was the, I drove through Youngstown, Ohio once because I was in the area. Um, these are the mills. So Truman ordered his Secretary of Commerce, Charles Sawyer, to take control of the mills. Again, this is nationalization of property. You may ask, why do you put the Emancipation Proclamation back to back with Youngstown? And I don't think I understood this at the outset, but they're both instances where the executive tries to seize property. They have that in common, at least. And in neither case was compensation provided. So Truman orders the Secretary of Commerce to seize the mills. What happened next is crazy. Okay, and um, I just want to give you the timeline. President Truman announced his strike on April eighth, shortly before the. Um, I'm sorry. Truman announced the seizure on April eighth, shortly before the strike. Okay, Truman sent messages to Congress. Okay, Congress did nothing. He sent another letter saying, hey, you guys, if you want to act, you should, right? Congress did nothing. So you go to the courts. Within 30 minutes of Truman's order, the steel companies sent a lawyer to the home of a district judge. All this business, right, where lawyers showing up at judges' houses, kind of crazy, right? Don't do this. You go to jail that way, right? <laughs> in fact, most judges don't list their home addresses. So there are ways of getting in touch with them if you need. Um, so within 30 minutes of the this, of this, of this strike, I'm sorry, of the uh, a seizure order, you have these lawyers show up at the home of a district judge. The judge actually ruled two days later that the president was acting unlawfully. You think nationwide injunctions are new? No, 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 they're, they're not new. Uh, this district judge issued an order declaring the seizure unconstitutional. And he enjoined nationwide the seizure of these mills. That was an act of some fortitude, right? He ultimately was vindicated. But a single judge basically told the President of the United States in time of war, you can't do this. Okay? The same day, the case is appealed to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. What does the D.C. Circuit do? Like, screw it. This is not our problem. They say, we're going to put the lower court decision on hold if you go to the Supreme Court in two days. So, right? so again, the district judge order on April 30th. The case is filed papers in the Supreme Court on May 2nd. Arguments are set for 10 days later. So basically within 12 days of a district court decision, it's at the Supreme Court. I'm talking like light and fast. And the court said, forget the court of appeals, we'll just do this ourselves, right? Very rare. Um, it was argued on May 12th through 13th of 1952, uh, five hours of argument time. And it was decided three weeks later. So basically from start to finish, about two months, which is lightning fast. And keep in mind during this time, they were rushing to get this out. Why are there like eight different opinions you have to read? Or I guess seven different opinions you have to read? They didn't have enough time to collaborate. The usual process is one person writes an opinion, they circulate it, right? They say, oh, I like this, I like that. But they didn't have the time. They said, let's just all write our own opinions and figure it out. Now, the majority opinion is by Justice Hugo Black, right? He had the most people join him. But the opinion that most people put weight on is Jackson. But I'll go through these chronologically. Okay. Uh, who's next? Alan. Alan, walk me through Justice Black's opinion, please. Uh, Justice Black basically ruled that only Congress or the Constitution uh, can do what the President uh, ordered. Okay, so Alan, let me ask you, I think you gave me the answer right, but let me ask you a different way. Where does a President get authority from under Justice Black's opinion? There are two possible places. Good, good, or? Or from Congress. Okay, very good. This is a very basic point. The president has two sources of authority, only two sources. An act of Congress or the Constitution itself. When Congress passes a statute, they can give the president authority to do X. But the president has his own source of authority, right? 
Article 2 of the Constitution. That's our true false question from the beginning of class, right? Does it give him this executive power? Does it enumerate powers for him? Okay. So, Abdul, is there any statute that gives the president the authority to take control of the steel mills during this strike? There's no statute. How do we know this? Yeah, we'll change everything. Right. But, Abdul, let me ask you a follow-up question then, right? Had Congress considered this issue before? Yeah, we were thinking about the tax cut. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm referring to, right. Yeah, so give me a little bit more. Sure, so um, they basically say this is Very good, very good, right. So here, here we have a situation. Congress consider the fact that a labor shortage may affect war, right? That a labor strike may mess things up. They could have given the president the power to seize mills unilaterally. They didn't. Instead, they created a specific procedure by which the president could go about resolving the strike. Now, did, did, did the president follow the procedure set up by Congress here? Uh, no, he didn't. No, he didn't. <coughs> he decided on his own. And that's a key point, right? So Congress had created a procedure that could have resolved the situation. The president, by his own admission, didn't follow that. He didn't follow it. Now, this goes back to energy, right? He says, I can't wait to go through this stupid process because they're going on strike in 30 minutes. I need to issue this order now. Um, the flip side is this wasn't a surprise. This, this, this conflict's been brewing for, for some time, right? It didn't come up overnight. In fact, this isn't like an invading army that shows up in the middle of the night. This labor strike had been uh, developing and, and building. So perhaps Truman could have gone through this process, but maybe he didn't want to, right? Maybe he didn't want to waste his time with his bureaucracy and said, screw it, I'm the president, I can do it. Now, McKinney, does Congress have the power to seize, appropriate, nationalize. This is what it was. They basically nationalized the steel mills, right? When I say they seize the steel mills, they put them under federal supervision. What does that mean? If a labor worker went on strike, he would be arrested. He'd be thrown in jail for violating the federal government order, right? He'd be thrown in jail for violating. So this is, this is like, like Hugo Chavez stuff. Right? This is nationalizing an industry. This is a big deal. McKinney, does the federal government have the power to nationalize an industry? Uh, Chief Justice Frankfurt, I'm sorry, not Chief Justice, but Justice Frankfurt in his concurring opinion said that, uh, yes, Congress does have power. Congress. Yeah. Congress has the power, right? Mm -hmm. Again, go to our takings clause. It's not property, but we can do it. If the government wants to take private property for public use, they can do it with compensation, right? Is seizing a steel mill public use? Maybe, probably, close enough. Okay, fine. They give compensation. There was no compensation given. The other aspect is to seize private property there's a hearing. You have to go before a judge and persuade the judge that this is public use. And guess what? You can, that, that judgment can be appealed. And that can be appealed. So imagine how much time it would have taken to seize every single steel mill in the country in every court when there's a threatened labor strike. So, again, Congress could have seized this, but they didn't. So, there's no statute, right? So then, Yvonne, we're stuck within the Constitution. That's the only ground on which the president can defend his actions, right? What parts, what clauses of the Constitution does the uh, Truman administration rely on to justify the seizure? What clauses of the Constitution does the president rely on? A little more specific. You got Article 2, you're in the right ballpark. Uh huh. There's a couple clauses that are relevant, yeah. Okay, and what do those provisions save on? Well, summarize them for me. I have to read them. Well, yeah, we're going to get to the inherent powers in a couple minutes, but just give me the ones that are actually listed. What powers are listed in the Constitution that the government relies on here?
Alex, what clauses does the, the government rely on in this case? It's not hard. Um, I just need an impact. April, sorry. April, yeah. Is it the, um, the takings clause? Not the takings clause. You're really close, though. I think you're close. Carlos. Um, well, uh, I'll, I'll go, I don't know if I'm getting a little bit ahead, but uh, in the defense of Sidney, he said uh, he was trying, that he was trying to act to the Secretary of Commerce. He said he's going to be his cabinet. Uh, I'm looking for a clause. This is oh, not hard. Okay. Okay, you have, you have an answer? It's not hard. They spend a lot of time talking about this. No, I don't know. I'm just thinking of Kill? I'm looking for a clause. JC. The commander in chief? Commander in chief, my God, it's on the board. I, I don't know what you guys are doing. This is really bad. Five people in a row. Not good. Commander in chief, yes. Okay. Now, I'll go back. Yvonne, what's the problem with the Commander-in-Chief Clause here, right? Why does the majority reject it? Why is it not relevant? Well, there's no declared war. That's true. But what else? What else beyond the fact there's no declared war? Alex, what's the other problem beyond the fact there's no declared war? Why is the Commander-in-Chief Clause not relevant here? Kill? Yes. Where would that clause apply? Yeah, you can take the cars. Yeah. Oh, yeah. War. The commander in chief clause applies to war, not domestic labor disputes, right? It will be a very radical extension. A very radical extension of the commander-in-chief power to reach domestic, local labor disputes, right? So the court rejects out of hand the reliance in the commander-in-chief clause, okay? All right, Alex, now what about the take care clause, right? What's the argument about from Justice Black there? The take care clause? Yes. April? Um. Stacy? What does a take care clause add to this analysis? What does a take care clause say? Was the seizure of the steel mills an execution of the laws? What does Justice Black say? Okay, you're on the right track. April, you add something? So, like, for the President can veto? Yes, exactly, exactly right. What Black says is that a take care clause is about executing the laws, not making the laws, right? The seizure of the mills was a legislative act. It looked like a statute. That the idea of executing the laws presumes the law already exists. There was no statute at this point. The president could not create this new laws. Okay? Everyone with me? Damn. <coughs> Congress can't 
has the authority or power to seize the, uh, yeah. the property. In the Fifth Amendment, it doesn't say Congress has this power or the president has this power. It doesn't. You're right. So you're making the Lincoln argument, right? You're saying the Fifth Amendment doesn't specify who has that power. Why can't the president do it? Um, the answer, I think, is gloss. That throughout American history, whenever property was seized, it was done by Congress, not the president. There was actually an article by a, by a colleague of mine at U Chicago called Will, his name is Will Bode, which argues that, the, that not even Congress has the power over eminent domain. That this means Congress can only take property in federal territories, not in the states. I'll leave that aside for now. But there's actually an argument that the Congress came into this. I'll leave that part. Yeah, Clinton. I would add to his question. A reason that I believe that uh, President doesn't have the only Congress, because Congress is the only one that has the capability to spend money. Right, and that's the other aspect, right? But it's not it's not dispositive, right? Because the President does have some assets on his own. Um, he has appropriated money that perhaps he could exercise his power unilaterally. But one of the justices makes the point that uh, when you have to pay compensation, it comes from the Treasury. And that can only come from the presidency. I'm sorry, only come from Congress. In theory, Congress give the president money, saying, "Here's a million dollars. Take whatever property you want." So, I mean, it's not that's not a that's not a. But that comes from Congress. Right, but that's not solely for Congress, though. That is, the president could exercise that theory. Yeah, yeah, uh, Kevin. So when we're saying that the take third clause is about executing laws, and that presumes the law already exists. Yes. Is that the same reasoning behind like regulating Congress <coughs> presumes? Commerce has already uh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, but the idea of the take care clause is it presumes the president has laws to execute. The president can't make new law. The court basically says that the that the seizure here is itself a seizure. I'm sorry, a creation of new law. Okay. All right. So we have the take care clause. We have the commander in chief clause, right? And the court dismisses all these concerns. Uh, Regina, what else, or what other type of authority does Truman rely on to defend this action? Well, describe it for me then. I'm not sure the clause. Well, that, that's commander in chief, right? That's commander in chief. But what other power are you talking about here? No. JC? <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs> the other argument that I saw that they made on his behalf was that this has been done in the past. This isn't the first time that something like this has happened. Good, 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 right? This is the notion of inherent powers. And we've talked about this today. And it comes from Article 2, Section 1, what's called the Vesting Clause. That, again, this phrase, executive power is vested in the United States. Lincoln argued that among those powers vested was his power to seize rebel property, right? And, and uh, uh, emancipate them. That's part of his commander in chief power for sure. But he says, I have this executive power, it's among my powers. Likewise, Truman argues that among his executive powers is the power to seize property prevent this labor shortage, or right, prevent this steel shortage. Um, Warren, how are we supposed to know if the inherent powers, executive powers, includes the power to take over steel mills? We're, how on earth are we supposed to know this? Where, where would we get this from? Uh, framers intent, man. Federalist Papers. Yeah, you read the same one I did today, Federal 70. I, I missed the paragraph on nationalizing steel mills there. I'm, 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 I'm being silly on purpose, but how are we supposed to know what these executive powers are? What's the, what can courts go on here? We've mentioned this point a few times today. What can courts go on? What can courts go on if they don't have the federal paper sort of thing? Um, precedent or yeah, you're right. Precedent. What does that mean? 
Exactly. This is the idea of the gloss, and this is Justice Frankfurter's opinion. Um, Justice, Glo uh, Justice Gloss, Justice Frankfurter, <laughs> by the way, he was a, a professor at Harvard Law School. The reason why you should never be professors justices. Um, his law clerk's called Hot Dogs, though, because he was Frankfurter. Look, he's got the little hot dogs. Um, uh, Frankfurter writes that practice, right? The Constitution is not just about the text, but the gloss which life has written upon them. And Frankfurter writes that when you have a long-standing executive practice, it forms a gloss on the meaning of the Constitution. That if there was this long-standing practice of president seizing property, that would be indication that the president can seize such property. Frankfurter acknowledges that there might be a couple examples. For example, Lincoln seized the railroads. And Roosevelt had some seizures as well. But he says those rare isolated episodes don't sanction Truman's actions. He's basically saying Lincoln broke the law. He's saying Roosevelt, who appointed him, broke the law. But you know, we're not talking about that here. right? That's, that, that was then, this is now. How long must a practice be before it establishes its gloss? Your guess is as good as mine. But Frankfurter says the government can't always be swift. And sometimes courts slow down the process. But what saves people from autocracy is a separation of powers, which precludes the arbitrary exercise of power. That was Frankfurter's concurring opinion. Any questions on either Black or Frankfurter? Yeah, JC. Yeah. A lot, a lot. Um, I'll get to Jackson in a minute, but Justice Robert Jackson was the lead prosecutor in Nuremberg. Um, he prosecuted the Nazis for war crimes. He understood very well what happens when you have a civilized nation and the rule of law decays. I mean, Germany was an established Western nation with universities, government, everything, and then in a fairly short span, it's evolved into a complete dictatorship. I think this was very clear in their minds that they're saying, if we let this one go, what's next? Right? What's going to happen next? They were afraid of what would happen to the, the American people as happened to the European continent. So very good point. Yeah. So. Um... Justice Frankfurter and um, Douglas, they both cite the Myers case. Yes. And is that the kind of precedent that we're relying on here? About so we didn't, we didn't do Myers, did we? No. no. Um, we'll do Myers probably in a week. Maybe next lesson, I can't remember. We'll do Myers soon. That, that case involved the removal power. Could the president fire someone from office, right? And that was an issue where the Constitution doesn't clearly give the president the power to fire somebody. The president can appoint, doesn't say how he can fire. And the court in Myers looked at the fact that president's been firing people since George Washington's day. And that was a gloss, a practice that built upon. Table your question to do Myers. We're actually, Myers isn't assigned, but we read a case called Morrison versus Olson. That's a special prosecutor, and it's within that case it's discussed. Okay. Quit. Um, going back to the taking clause, I think. Clinton had mentioned something about how Douglas uh, talked about how only Congress could like actually put the money aspect in this. And you said that's not necessarily dispositive. It, it, it probably is, but it doesn't have to be. He just, I don't know, his opinion made it seem like it was. And I guess I'm trying to like reconcile that. Like it, it would totally be within Congress's well, imagine this, right? Imagine Congress gave the president an, an eminent domain fund. They said, we'll give you a billion dollars every year to seize whatever property you want. You can pay off your own budget. Whatever you don't spend, you return to Congress, right? Okay. The president could exercise power to seize steel mills if he wanted to. I mean, that's not what we have here, but I don't see any reason why that, that's not possible. Um, Justice Douglas, uh, who was also a result appointee, made this point well about the takings power. Um, but I, I do think as a general matter here, Congress did not give Truman the money, so therefore he could not have paid 
the compensation for seizing the mills. They could have, but they didn't. Make sense? All right, let's move on. And let's go to Justice Jackson. I'll, I'll, uh, this is the main opinion. And I want to walk you through this. Uh, Jackson puts forward a framework, which law students, they love frameworks, right? Um, but don't apply this everywhere, okay? You're only going to apply this framework in a separation of powers case where it's unclear what the president's powers are. Um, far too many students say, aha, Congress passed a statute, the president signed the law, therefore we're in Jackson's first tier. That's wrong. Okay, I'll get that in maybe 10 exams, it's all wrong, okay? But Jackson puts forward this framework that says there are not many good resources to understand how to resolve this dispute. They just, just aren't, they don't exist. Um, instead, he says, we have to be practical. He had been Roosevelt's attorney general, but now he's a justice and he's taking a little bit of a different <coughs> position. And he says, let's look at the interaction between Congress and the presidency. So he imagines these three tiers, right? These three tiers. Um, they're not chiseled in stone. They're flexible. But you have this first tier where the president his authority is at a maximum. Why? Because the president acts pursuant to an express or implied grant from Congress. What does that mean? Congress gave the president the power to do X. And the president has his own powers to do X. So you have what? Article 1 plus Article 2. Right? You have all the Article 1 powers given and all the Article II powers given, right? The president's acting at the peak of his authority. How should courts treat that? You have what's called a presumption of constitutionality, right? Where the courts basically have to presume, all right, if the president's acting here with Congress's support, in terms of a gloss, right, we gotta step back. And we shouldn't strictly scrutinize, we shouldn't closely review these actions. Okay? I'm going to skip number two for a minute. I'll come back to number three. Then you have what's called the lowest ebb. Right? This is where you have you have nothing from Congress, right? Congress has not given the president this power. In fact, they may have told Congress, I'm sorry, Congress may have told the president, you can't do this. All you're relying on is Article II powers. The president only has his own powers. Here the courts have to be rightfully skeptical, Jackson says. They must scrutinize with caution. Right? If the president's acting only is on accord in the separation of powers, courts should be skeptical because Congress hasn't backed him up. And then you have this middle one, which always drives students nuts, right? The zone of twilight, right? Where it isn't clear. It isn't clear whether Congress gave power or if the president is relying us on independent powers. This case is easy for Jackson. He says, look, this is number three, right? We're in the bottom tier. Congress considered giving the president this power and decided not to. Therefore, he's acting only his own inherent powers. Jackson finds no such inherent powers exist. And he rules that the actions are unconstitutional. So this is a case where it's clearly in the third, uh, third tier. This has become the definitive framework going forward. Although, as you'll see next week in the case of Daines and Morby Regan, the court tweaks it a bit. It doesn't apply it directly. So questions on Jackson. Hey, so these, you named them Zone of Twilight, Low as Ed. Uh, are those something, that, is that the term or should we? That's what I call it? That's what you call okay. Yeah, I mean, Jackson doesn't really give it a name either. I yeah. call it that to make, that's what I have in my notes as. You can okay. call it whatever you want. Okay, so those names are not. One, two, and three work also. But but if you give a label, it helps you remember them. Okay, yeah. So we can put it in another label. <clears throat> you can do whatever you want. Zone of Twilight again? The zone of twilight is this 
Here from the Twilight Zone, right? What's Twilight? It's not quite day. It's not quite night. Very hazy. The zone of twilight is where it's unclear if the president's acting with or without congressional power. Maybe Congress addressed it, maybe they did it, maybe it's vague. He says, no abstract theory of law will resolve this. All right, this is the most important opinion from the case. Um, let me, yeah, Abdul. You, you just said the last sentence, you said what was it? You said, uh, oh yeah, you said no abstract law would define. No abstract theory of law will define what that means. So then how do we, so what's, what's the way that figure from Just based on, just practice. Practice. Loss, yeah. Not, not a satisfactory answer. Uh, let me wrap up, you come with questions afterwards. I'll make sure I finish this in time, but I'll come back to you for questions. Um, the dissent by Justice Vincent, Reed, and Minton um, goes full bore with the Commander-in-Chief clause. They say, look, this is obviously Commander-in-Chief. The President has this power. And they cite examples where previous Presidents have acted in ways inconsistent with Congressional authority, and no one objected. They cite Federal Number 70, that they're vigorous and energetic executive, however defined they define it in the way perhaps we do. And they say, we shouldn't be afraid of dictatorships, right? Because he's only acting until Congress can act. Now, I want to give you now the aftermath of the case. Within minutes of the ruling, President Truman ordered the Secretary of Commerce to return the steel mills to the owners. He followed the rule. Did he have to? Maybe yes, maybe no. Now, the strike lasted 50 days after that. Did the country fall apart? No. Apparently it wasn't that big of an emergency, after all. Things kept chugging along. Uh, I'll stop with this point. Justice Black invited Truman to the White House. I'm sorry, invited Truman to the court. And Truman said, Hugo, I think it was Hugo Black, I don't care much for your law, but by golly, this bourbon is good. And so even then, with this clash of separation of powers, things trickled on. All right, thank you so much. Questions come up afterwards, and I'll see you all next Thursday.